I got involved in the civil rights movement at the age of 17 with the NAACP. And then at the age of 19, I got involved with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And through that effort, I began to work to try to see that all people were treated equal, that we all were as one, and to do away with racism and discrimination. You got to fight. You got to fight for every breath of your life and stand up for what is right and what is just. My father, from an early age, used to say, especially to his son, said, I'm the youngest of 12 children. There were seven boys and five girls. And he used to say, especially to his boys, so you have to stand up for what is right. He said, even if you are the only one that is standing, you have to stand there alone until others get the knowledge, the understanding, and the courage to stand with you. So I'm in the process of attempting to stand. So when I look at our brothers and sisters that's from South and Central America and how they are uh, attempted to be barred from coming into this country, I realized that at one particular time, especially the Southern part of the United States, that was land that their foreparents owned, worked, and made a living for themselves and their family. And now we find people in this country attempting to keep them out. And to me, they're just simply attempting to come back home. Because as I say, that part of the United States was illegally stole and hijacked in one sense from the people that is in South and Central America. So they have a right to come back home and utilize that land which their foreparents once occupied. And I feel that it is my obligation to aid and assist, do all I can to help them overcome that barrier because as I was saying the same things that black people have had to go through in this country we find that people from South and Central America in particular are having to go through those same things as it relates to jobs places to stay, stay and especially for those that are working in the agriculture sector. Mm. Good everything. Good everything. Good everything. Oh, hold on. Let me do this. Shut up. Let's go. Let's go. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good mm -hmm. everything. Dr. Greg Carr. Yeah. Episode one up. Uh, Lesson 186, we are here uh, in class with Carr. And um, good, at, good everything, Professor Karen Hunter. We are riding again. Here we go. Yeah. Um, that was Hollis Watkins. Hollis Watkins Muhammad. Uh, Muhammad. Who, yeah, who made transition on the 20th of this month. His uh, rituals of initiation are this morning, actually, in his native Mississippi, Tougaloo. Uh, he was in state last night and the funerals this morning at 11 Central Standard at Tougaloo College in the Kroger Gymnasium. Uh, he was and is a stalwart, uh, one of the founding forces in SNCC in Mississippi, um, gave his whole life, founder of Southern Echo, which is a community based organization in Mississippi. And there's so much in fact, his 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 memoir is called Brother Hollis. The Sankofa of a Movement Man. We'll talk about this inside the show. I'll show you the cover right quick. It's him right there. This brother, uh, he and his wife, Edna Watkins Muhammad, um, just brilliant. He, his physical remains will be taken this morning to the Chisholm Mission AME Church Cemetery. Uh, Chisholm Mission, which is uh, the name also of the, the place where he grew up, the farm, youngest of 12 children, 
just a, a such a powerful force. And man had a singing voice, sang all the movement songs. I think it was Bob Moses when he Bob Moses when he came to Mississippi. They went looking for him, and they said, uh, it's "Hollis Walkers walked up and said, are you Martin Luther King?' No, I'm uh, I'm Bob Moses. Okay, well, I'm uh, the, the, the voter registration man in this county. So <laughs> Hollis Walkers is so much more we can talk about. Uh, talk I remember about. that. I'm I'm reading Radical Equations. So. Oh, yeah. I remember that particular scene. That is so that is so wild. Um, and I want to thank you because part of in class with car is an introduction to people that we don't know. Um, and it's also to keep the names of people alive, keep people alive through erecting their names, which is why you always do the genealogy. I know some people get like, why why does he go? Yeah, because we have to tell you who begat who begat what. And um this this world will have certain people picked for their own purposes that will end up on classroom walls. But it's the Hollis Watkinses of the world that, um, as he said, will stand alone until the rest of us get the courage to stand as well. And they they need um, for us to know who they are. So thank you. Absolutely. And, I, and that particular clip, you know, to, to, to start with his voice talking about the indigenous people, because we are indeed in their land. Uh, regardless of what the governor of Texas may think of Florida, uh, who, you know, crawled out of some place in Europe and emptied their bile here uh, again in classrooms. They're called settlers. But are they? No, they're invaders. And so, as Hollis Watkins said there, and it's, and it's particularly poignant because today is the 30th of September and uh, on the 29th of September, uh, 1526 at a place called Sapelo Sound in Georgia. A uh, cat named San Miguel de Guadalupe, Guadalupe uh, brought some of us captive into that area. So when we start talking about who were the first and Africans who were captives who were brought to North America, take that 1619, take the pencil and erase that and put in 1526, because that is, in fact, not the Anglo centric um, American exceptionalist cleaving to the masters of the English. No, it was the Spanish in 1526. And we just passed the 497th anniversary yesterday of that, of that forced migration. So when he's talking about them indigenous people, you know, he brought, he brought it full circle right back around. And and I want to say it's okay to let go of wrong information. It is. You know, I mean, or, or, or do add information because 1619 is not wrong. No, it, I'm, I'm saying that, that like there's a, uh, a a defense of to the point of yes. like I'm not even going to you know, open myself up to new information because if I do that, then it erases this information that I have, you know, grown to know to be true. And then that somehow in people's minds or psyches, I believe, you know, makes them feel like there's something that they're giving up of themselves. But it's really you opening yourself up to to truth. Like we should want to know all of the truth. And when we learn new truth, like Columbus didn't discover America. OK, can we accept that? Don't be mad about it. You don't have to. You can still have your parade. And it is it is not Italian heritage because we're not even sure that he was. But that's neither here nor there. Even if he was, that's no. Why are you wedded to something wrong? Why do you want to be? Why do you want to be wrong? That's my the question. question. That's the question. In fact, that's a beautiful question. So yeah, yeah. yeah so I, I feel like you know when uh, when you, you sent me uh, what we're going to talk about today. So I was like, first just of all, topic. We'll talk more about it in a minute. <laughs> I, I was thinking, you know, uh, can we imagine a world without whiteness? I know somebody's going to read that, and especially if they're in a common space that is broad and not behind, uh, you know, in our comfort zone of Nubia, and feel like, oh, these people are racist. You know, I get that a lot. You know, I, all you talk about is race. I'm like, mm, no, but that's what you're honing in on. But then why are you angry about this conversation about whiteness, even when you're challenged about your own whiteness? When when I ask, because, you know, I do that frequently when people call up, you know, yeah. when they call up so, <laughs> as a white man. And I say, what does it mean to be a white man? What does that mean? And they can't answer it. And then they get angry because you can't answer it. What's white culture? You can't. And then so they'll do the Larry Elder throw a question back at me when you can't answer a question. Shout out, shout out to Van Lathan. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so when, when they get mad, and they, well, what does it mean to be black? I said black was invented to give a juxtaposition to whiteness, which was made as a hierarchy and a construct of power. So you had to always have black to, you know, be able to denigrate somebody else because that's, you know, as Toni Morrison would say, you're only tall by standing on someone. If you can only be tall, what, 
are you any good, right? If you are only tall by standing on somebody. So whiteness was invented to create this construct that could never go away. And how sick is it that people can come here like Italians and not be white? And then all of a sudden you're white. Oh, hey, Ron DeSantis, you know, the Irish were not white. <laughs> their, their whole book's about this. That's not true. white, That's not true. white, then became white. That's people true. who speak Spanish, come on, y'all. That's right. We weren't even on the census. There was no Latino or Hispanic on the census before 1970. Teach. So I'm like, all of these constructs, why do we hold on to them? And then we're mad when we get challenged instead of saying, oh, this is new information. Thank you. Thank you for the new information. So now, um, not sure why this happened. You're muted. Did you mute on purpose, Dr. Carr? Okay. All yeah. Right. No, okay. Now, now, why do you think? Why do you think people so, want to so, yeah. let go? This is this, in fact, again, y'all, this is our conversation. This is very organic, and we didn't rehearse this, but this is exactly why this topic comes to play. Why, why do you think why? 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 I mean, I, I just think about myself, some things that you know mm -hmm. I, I thought about the world that I found out puts me in a different position, particularly globally. You know, mm -hmm. when I start to think about, I, I had a young lady, I was talking about 9-11 and I used to be, you know, you know America, America. And <laughs> I, I have a young person in my class who was a little girl at the time the 9-11 happened and she got treated poorly by her teachers. Mm -hmm. She wore a hijab and she couldn't understand it. And she told her mom, her mom came to school with her hijab, teacher mistreat, you know, was belligerent to her. And the teacher got sick and the, and the young girl wrote a letter wishing her well. And it, you know, it broke the teacher's, you know, you know, nastiness. And she told the mom, I, I didn't know how nice your little girl was. And she was like, she's six. Why would you assume that she's not what you think she's a terrorist? Like it's, you know, these preconceived notions that we have about people based on what we've been indoctrinated into that all people who are Muslims are, you know, it's a billion Muslims. You think every Muslim is a terrorist? Like, and the biggest terrorism happens in our borders by people who uh, call themselves white and they say people won't replace them. And they're the ones going around, you know, terrorizing folk. Um, and and to, to Mr. Hollis's point, you know, it's like we are mad at folk coming into this country when this country has done some things to destabilize. It doesn't mean I want to go anywhere else. So the question is, well, why don't you go back to where you came from? I come from here. I come from here. Why don't you be a better person so you can make it palatable for all of us to live on this globe together and not be at odds? It's weird. I don't really have an answer for you as I'm thinking about it. I don't know why people want to hold on to wrong, Dr. Carr. I don't know why. Do you? There's a visceral response at the 58 years of living and 30 plus now going on close to closer to 40 every day years of learning and teaching and, and, you know, kind of a craft practice. And I have to calibrate it. I won't say suppress it. I never suppress it, but I have to calibrate it out of love and respect for our common humanity. Um, the visceral response. And the, one of the things I loved about uh, Baba Hollis is that his spirit is so gentle, but he was still hard. You know, he's just a little guy, you know, and, you know, of course, just very, you know, it kind of is so funny that he adopted Islam, he and his wife, because it reminds you a little bit of Elijah Muhammad. In fact, in the last chapter of his book, he talks about the power of the Million Man March and how, you know, the white media tried to make it into a Muslim thing. But we refused that. And so so I'm trying to, to calibrate this because, you know, my spirit is not a, you know, I'm a, I'm a happy person generally. Um so the first thing that comes to mind is because we love our masters, but I'm going to calibrate that <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> but we do. We, we love our masters. We well, love pause, because that also is going to make people go, wait a minute, wait a minute. I know. I know it is, which is why I had to calibrate it, because I feel that with my whole heart, because I understand what enslavement has done. I mean, everything we do is calibrated to whiteness. Everything. You know, there's no difference between 1776 and 1619. And there's no difference between 70, 70, 1776, 1619, and 1526. All of those are, are, are calibrated to whiteness in two ways. Number one, they're calibrated toward a Judeo-Christian calendar, even though those Abrahamic traditions are African exports. The number system we use is absolutely linked to the tiny part of Western Eurasia we call Europe, the Gregorian calendar. And number two, they are linked to whiteness because they are the dates that mark and reinforce a narrative 
of the creation of whiteness and settler expansion. So anytime we start talking about the first this to do this, the first this to do this, we are reinforcing whiteness. And so this came up in a conversation. So when, in fact, the question was asked, you know, this is this is the question was asked at the Why We Gather conference, uh, writers conference that took place on Howard's campus Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and 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 uh, and, and Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. Uh, Brother Ben Talton and the crew at the Morning Spin Garden Research Center did a remarkable job. But at the uh, we did a panel and I'll talk more about that in a minute. But on, on five o'clock on Thursday. There was a conversation between uh, Nicole Hannah Jones, our brother, Mike Harriet, and a sister named Nicole Carr. No blood relation, although I suspect we all escaped from the car plantations in the Caribbean. But um, around the necessity and charge of black journalists in, an, in a quote unquote eroding democracy. I reject all that language. Um, we don't have borders. The United States of America has borders. We don't have a country. There's a country called the United States of America that we live in. If we would say go back somewhere. I would be very happy to go back and forth because people seem to think when you go somewhere, you can't go somewhere else. The whole globe is where we live. We do not live in these uh, these little pockets called countries and then and pledge allegiance and wear, wear their flags around like we're in some kind of damn sports competition. But we've been anchored to whiteness. So at the end of this panel, right before our panel uh, was me, uh, Ilya Davis from Morehouse College, uh, Melanie Carter from Howard, uh, our Baba, Nate Norman, came up from Morehouse as well. He was Ilya, uh, Josh Myers, who teaches in African studies at Howard, one of my former students, and Natalie Hawkins, who's over at American, the journalist who used to be at Howard. But at any rate, our con our conversation was about the black university. Is it possible? Well, of course, it's not. But, you know, we had that conversation. And in fact, I'll drop in the in the YouTube and in Nubia uh, the link. I, I would encourage people to watch the conference as much as you want, but particularly that panel that we talked about. And right before that panel, the last questioner on the panel where Mike and Nicole uh, were on, asked them a question that sent them into, uh, they couldn't answer it. <laughs> and of course, I started our panel by saying, I want to take a stab at that question. The question the brother asked was, where's the future of black people in the absence of white people? Mm. I'll leave everybody here to watch it for yourself and judge the answers. And they and and, and basically it was mostly uh, Nicole and Mike answering, trying to answer. And, and it was like uh, they were saying, well, we're all mixed in together now. You know, it's black and white and Hispanic and everybody's blended in together. And we ain't never going to have a, a place with no one. And all of the questions were unerringly confined to the four corners of the United States. Uh, I think Nicole said, you know, we, people talk about white people being the minority. Yes, but they will be the largest racial minority and a plural. Side. And so we got to figure out how to, and I'm just listening. I had, I had complete sympathy with them. I absolutely understood two brilliant people grappling with this question. I have complete clarity on how to answer that question. We must destroy whiteness, not white people, but you can't imagine. And so, the, and so when people talk about y'all always talking about race, I am with those people. All y'all say we're sick of talking about race. I'm standing right there shoulder to shoulder with you. Why? Because I am not a figment of the white imagination. So, you know, Ibram Kendi was there. Of course, Tanazi coach, Jelani Cobb came down. It was all, every panel, almost every panel, almost every conversation got race at the center, which means what? Whiteness is at the center. We're not going to live our lives in response to whiteness, except we are. So can we imagine a world without whiteness? The simple answer is no. Mm. The simple answer is no. <laughs> anyway. No, no, I mean, I, I, um, when I used to do my little uh, hits on MSNBC when I was a paid contributor there, Ben Jealous um, was on a panel with me. You know, they would do these, you know, panels. And I mm -hmm. went up to him. I didn't know him at the time. And I said, hey, um, if a magic wand, this is off camera, if a magic wand were waved and there's no more uh, racism, and at the time he was a, the head of the NAACP, uh, you wouldn't have a job, right? Ooh. And he, and he said, uh, Ooh. no. He said, no, no. But to his credit, which is why I still um, rock with, I no rock question. with Ben Jealous. No question. He said it would be the greatest day of my life. No question. Had happily not have a job. No question. When I think about, you know, all of the organizations that depend on black trauma and racism, 
to yeah. exist to get the millions of dollars that they get from Mackenzie Scott and the government and other places. It is to get their million dollar salaries. It is the thing that that allows them to have relevance. And I want to imagine a world where we don't have to have that. Where exactly. where there's no, and and when I listen to Mr. Hollis Watkins, he's talking about humanity, right? Yes. And, and, and as people you know say, oh, that's reverse racism. Is it reverse racism to want everyone to eat, to to have, to have rights, to to have a roof over their heads, to be able to move freely and not be, uh, you know, ostracized or or worse, you know, demonized by police force or whatever, you know, like you can't imagine that. No one's carrying a tiki torch tell, talking about people replacing them in our community. We're not out there, you know, saying we want to bomb your your churches and and lynch your people. No one in our community is out there trying to destroy your history from the classroom and not teach our children. So why, are, why is that at the center of, you know, this, this movement of whiteness? And that, that to me caps, captures what whiteness is. It is the, the unyielding desire to uh, oppress other people so that you can continue to have this uh, facsimile of, of power, this, 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 this figment of your imagination in terms of lording over people. Why do you want to lord over people? Why do you want to be superior to anyone? Why do you want to be over anyone? Can't everyone live? Can't I have a cow? Why do you want to kill my cow? Because you don't have one. And instead of going out and working and getting a cow, you mad that everybody has a cow. So you want to kill everybody's cow. It's wild to me. Or creating a, a system where everybody has a cow. Or if you don't have a cow, you can we, can, can I breed my cow so that I can give you a calf? Exactly. How about that? Yeah. Everybody can eat. And this, what you do with that cow after that, don't be mad if you uh you know ran your cow into the ground and now I have a bunch of cows and I gave you a cow and you still mad. You know, it's it's just to your point. Um, the fact that people can't answer that question is I I, I also give grace because when have we had a time, Dr. Carr, when we haven't seen ourselves through the lens of whiteness? Well, we can really think about it. Well, I think interestingly enough, interestingly enough, the conversations over the three days were informed by demonstrated examples and work of us not doing that. But when it comes to interpreting it, that's where the fear comes in. I mean, the whole, I mean, Ruben uh, Santiago Hudson was there yesterday um, and, and with a bunch of playwrights and dramatists. They were talking about writers rooms and they were talking about the difference between theater and television and movies and and wanting to imagine, you know, what to do if they had unlimited budgets. Uh, our sister Nicole Salters, who's the chair of the theater department, at Howard asked the question, if you all had no financial restraints, what projects would you make? Ruben Santiago Hudson said, I'd make the Harlem Renaissance. I'd make a five part two hour a piece series on the Harlem Renaissance. And I was sitting with Dr. Norman. Pop said, what about the black arts movement? I said, I mean, not that you couldn't, not that you couldn't do the Harlem Renaissance and shouldn't do the, you should do the new Negro movement. But I'm saying even the conversations were limited by the trauma. The right. trauma is where our, our, our identity begins. They couldn't push past the wall of slavery and our response to it. Now in our response to it, is the we. This is why that Africana States framework it is indispensable. The governance formations, how we answer that question is how we live our lives. Hollis Watkins lived his entire life. In fact, he begins, let me see what I do with his book. He begins his autobiography with a chapter entitled, In the Beginning, Sowing the Seeds of Sovereignty and Liberation. This man was born in an all-Black community. He grew up on an all-Black farm. He went to Black schools, went to one of them county training schools in Mississippi. He went to Tougaloo. I mean, so when, when you see these, Mrs., and this is the point, Charlie Cobb, who wrote the introduction, uh, Brother Charlie Cobb, who I should mention, his wife uh, and sister-in-law, uh, Ann Chan and Ann Cobb, their sisters. Ann Cobb used to teach at Coppin. They're the heads of the Middle Passage Ceremonies and Port Markers Project. They always make a point of commemorating September the 29th because that three and four, they've been doing this work for a long time. But anyway, Charlie Cobb used to say this and Bob Moses used to say this as well. We were young when we went to Mississippi. One of the things Hollis Watkins would, Watkins would ask anybody coming is how long are you staying? In other words, not near. Anyway, and of course, Ella Baker would say it's the job of the organizer to put herself, to put himself out of a job. But what, what Cobb would say, what Bob Moses would always say about these Mississippians was, we didn't teach them. Ms. Hamer, Amzie Moore, they taught us, you know, Hollis Watkins, they taught us, you need a black whale. What they taught us was black self-determination. Yeah, we were there to get the vote, 
But the, the, the animating, what we would call ways of knowing and cultural meaning making and movement and memory, these people knew their history and roots in their community. The answer to that is they didn't depend on white people. So I was going to ask you, how much of this, um, even this conference, even mm -hmm. publishing, which I'm, you know, looking at through a different lens, thanks to you. And I want, I want to just say thank you. I feel like, you know, a, a, a blind has been lifted. Um, and I appreciate, you know, being able to see very clearly with this clean glass of water that's poured regularly here. Um, how much of it is fear tied to commerce? Fear that we can't make make a way for ourselves, even though we've only made a way for ourselves when we're not, uh, you know, I mean, you think about all of the communities built with no government assistance, the whole damn new deal didn't include us. Somehow we ended up figuring it out, you know, even packed into, you know, the great migration into these little four square blocks, millions of people, you know, just packed in like cattle. We figured out how to create, how to live, how to survive, how to even thrive, a lot of us. How much of it is the fear that somehow Massa won't give us any more money and, and we are serving this great whiteness because there's there's a profit in it for some of us, for a few of us. So we're going to keep that going because it helps our own personal pockets. How much of that is the fear that we stay in these places because we don't really believe that we can do it ourselves? I, that's a difficult question for me because I think it's co-mingled. There's an alloy. In other words, it's it's it, it's commingled. There's certainly that fear. There's certainly that fear, and it was on display. In fact, you know, somebody asked the question. No, no, they were talking about working in black spaces and working in white spaces on the panel that Mike and Cole were on. And Mike said, you know, you know, I'm at the Grio, and it's important that I be there, and Nicole be at the New York Times. And at the same time, because these stories have to be told, the sister Nicole Carr works in Atlanta. She's in television broadcast journalism primarily and also teaches. And she was talking about being in these newsrooms. Like she said, I was the one who was tasked with covering the Ahmaud Aubrey case. And they, they were narrating it one way and I had to push that. And so we have to have those ourselves in those, in those white spaces. But as they were talking, a uh, sister asked a question. She was a freelance journalist, a very good freelance journalist. Mike, you know, made that point because he knew her. And she asked the question, you know, what, what advice do y'all have for freelance journalists who are out here trying to make a living and do, you know, and the conversation of you got to make a living came up. Mike was like, you know, hey, you got to pay the bills. So there you got to figure out what part, you know, you're you going to be the revolutionary in a conservative uh, newsroom or vice versa. And I thought to myself, I don't know about vice versa, except maybe where we are with the blackness and the governance. if you're in the governance for, formation. But uh, and by the way, uh, Ben Jealous, well, I don't know. He probably he might be at Hollis Walkins ritual. You know, he's, he's he, he worked for the Jackson Advocate. He came out of news, of course, as you well know. Um, I figure that um, um, I figure that Derek Johnson will be there, President of MCP, because he's one of uh, uh, Hollis Watkins was his Jegna, one of his Jegnas. The Watkins were in particularly in, in, in youth development. But um, in those. In those moments where we think we have to rely on whiteness and white people for our existence, then that fear is there. I think also there is the very real problem, and this is the grounding problem as far as I'm concerned, of having our memory amputated. It's amputated memory. So that, you know, in, in every conversation at the conference, there is this conversation on recovering memory. And all of that is very important work. At the same time, it can't be bracketed. The momentum of memory requires going back before somebody put their hands on us on the continent of Africa, because that is the trauma that frames all of the recovery. It even even before that moment, we if we go back into African memory, we're looking for ways to prove our humanity to whiteness. Well, we created math. We created. Uh, hey, I've, I've been guilty of that myself. We create, why is that important? It's important because we got to show these people we're human, too. But what is never challenged is the definition of what it means to be human. So when we, you know, jumped in after after that, that panel and I said, you know, I want to start with the question the brother asked at the end of the last panel. And opened it up to that conversation. 
And by the end of that conversation, uh, somebody during the question and, 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 and answer, and you all can see it. I, I dropped the link in, in all the chats to the to the conference. He said, uh, the brother asked, what about John Brown? You know, these heroic figures, you know, people. And I said, John Brown is a remarkable person. And of course, if you all, those of you who are new to narrative, new to Nubia or not yet in it, you know, we had a long time. We've had several conversations about John Brown over several sessions. So you can go back and look at them with chapter and verse, the books, the documents, read through John Brown. And so I gave like maybe a little 30 second summary. I said, you know, John Brown's a remarkable figure in the Africana studies framework. If you look in the social structure, the challenge we have is John Brown, his family, his wife, his children, the sacrifices they made, the back and forth going on, trying to foment a rebellion, you know, all of that becomes elevated and he becomes the representative figure, the leader of sorts. Now, if you take John Brown and put him in the governance formation, if you read Francis Rollins uh, autobiography or biography, rather, of Martin Robeson Delaney, Life and Public Services of Martin Delaney, shout out Larry Crow, always, and, and the crew in Chicago for introducing that to me decades ago, then you see John Brown is a heroic figure among many other heroic figures who are black. And I cited John Henry Clark from when uh, we had that debate between Dr. Clark and Dr. West, Cornell West, many years ago at Ohio State. And Cornell had come to town the day before and he had given a public lecture at Ohio State and the crowd was overwhelmingly white. And he was talking about, you know, John Brown and, you know, as he will always do, bring everybody in. And then that next day we're in the debate that the Clark opened up with, you know, I understand you were talking about John Brown. And he said, and she, he said, yeah, I understand that. I said, but he said, but what about Shields Green? I'd rather talk about Shields Green. Shields Green was one of the black men with Dangerfield, Newby, and others. And we talked about that. We talked about John Brown, who said, I think I'll go with the old man. And that's what I said Thursday night. I said, if you put John Brown in a field of blackness, he becomes another human being struggling. But if you put him in a social structure, he becomes the representative type. And all the rest of us, you know, little boys in paintings looking, kissing John Brown's beard. We bowing down. John Brown is Jesus Christ. John Brown is Santa Claus. John Brown is your supervisor at work. John Brown is the white president of the United States. John Brown is the white central figure that around which we must organize our humanity. And so what I said was, this is how you answer the question. Can you imagine a world, you know, without whiteness? What is the, what is the future of black people in the absence of white people? The answer is, from a governance perspective, we must destroy whiteness. And what you destroy whiteness you might end up destroying blackness too. And that'd be okay too. If you're talking about destroying racial configurations and allowing the cultural configurations to emerge, we're not gonna lose our identity. We will regain it fully. So when we talk about that fear, the fear is, I think a fear of this is where we are. And somebody, brought, several panelists brought that up over the art. This is where we are. I'm not gonna grapple with the past. I'm not thinking about the future. I'm thinking about the right now. So that survival thing kind of becomes a thing that makes it very painful to hear the responses because that, that fear, that, that, that apprehension, I won't call it fear, the apprehension is there. But the other thing, the other thing that is that it is hard. And this is where Ayikwe Arma continues to speak into all our ears. In his novel, The Resolutionaries, in his book, um, the Eloquence of the Scribes, his book of essays, in his uh, book of essays, remembering the dismembered, mis, dis, the remembering the dismembered continent. In his novels, Osiris Rising and Kemet in the House of Life, he keeps making this point. You have to do that slow, collective, accretive work. The theme of the morning Spangard conference this year, the writers conference, the black writers conference, which revives a, a tradition that was going on in the 1970s was when we gather. And I don't know where the theme came from, but I suspect that one of the tributaries might have been a quote from Dizzy Gillespie. This is something I included when I wrote a chapter for the African World History Project that ASCAC is doing on how we think about historiography. And, and I include a, a Dizzy Gillespie quote. Uh, where he says improvisation is the act of gathering together all the techniques for how you move from here to here to here and that gathering together means that you practice your cultural meaning making out of movement and memory in other words you don't just wake up 
making music. You don't so wake up acting or writing. You don't wake up just speaking and dancing. You inherit this the momentum of what has been done before, and then you add your thing. You mix your thing. You remix your thing. And an improvisation looks like you're making it up as you go along, but what you're really doing is almost a form of spontaneous composition based on the rhythms that you have developed out of your deep memory. But developing that deep memory is hard. If we're on a basketball court, if we're on parallel bars in gym, if we're on a football field, we don't think twice about acquiring some form of basic competence before we begin to improvise. And so expanding that into our movement of memory in terms of building our memory, not to live in the past, but to be in the present and to craft a future, this is what allows us to do it. So what are our objectives? Our objectives, again, what we've been doing these last three years is so important because we and, and the reason that it's so and many of the, among many of the reasons that it's so important is that it is consistent. It's like a metronome. And but but it's not a metronome to be consumed. Digested, taken apart, exchanged, having conversation in in these little bursts that don't connect to each other. And so, you know, our objectives are to work together work together for a past, a present, and a future, working together, displays of individual brilliance are not impressive beyond the individual moment when you experience the brilliance. It also has to engender inspiration. It also has to model instruction. The very good book called Tacky's Revolt, the author was here at, at the conference, uh, Vincent Brown, and they were talking about maroonage. Okay. Studying maroonage is incredibly important. We have to recover that memory. Then the question becomes, what does maroonage look like right now? See, how's Watkins and them were in maroonage in Mississippi. So when Charlie Cobb, I mean, uh, and again, I think about our, our sister, Dory Ladner, who I don't know if she traveled or not. I can imagine she was because it was Mama Dory born the same year as Hollis Watkins who told me when this book first came out, Greg, I get this book. Shout out to Mama Dory. She hadn't been feeling in the best uh, health in these last a few months, but I know, you know, in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, they built that strong stuff. So love you, Mama Dory Ladner. And so, but, you know, those people were already in sovereignty. Yes, they were in a social structure of apartheid. And yes, they fought it tooth and nail. Their whole lives, they, they are fighting this. But that is not the defining element of their life. They're fighting it. And I made this point Thursday night. They are fighting it from a center. So when, when brother asked about John Brown, I said, you know, I said, that's, that's a good question. I said, we engaged John Brown. When you read, as we talked about, when we talked about John Brown, when, when you read uh, uh, Frank, Fra Francis Watkins, she used a pen name, Frank Watkins. In fact, I was just reading, oh man, do I have, yeah, this is fascinating. Just reading this book, Francis, uh, Francis Rollin was a writer, a brilliant sister. This is a, um, a book by one of her descendants, her great granddaughter, Frances Ann Rollins' great granddaughter is, called, is named Carol Ioni. She wrote a book here. And if you can see, this book is called Pride of a Family, Four Generations of African-American Women of Color. Again, a very important genealogy, the words of color stricken from my mind. But I'm bringing it up because she's writing about her great grandmother, Frances Rollins, who wrote the biography of Martin Delaney. And in that biography, Delaney it describes when John Brown came to Canada and met with him, his wife, you know, and they drafted that constitution for a new country in Canada. I said, that is a governance conversation. John Brown not sitting with a bunch of white people. He's going to the black communities. I said, if you want to go into the future, you talk about Afrofuturism, you can get Terry Bisson's little book, Fire on the Mountain, which is like a, a, a futuristic projection of what would have happened if the brothers and sisters involved and around John Brown had actually won that fight. And so it doesn't drag you onto the Ken Burns plantation, the Ken Burns plantation populated with people of African descent who are talking about black maroonage in the context of American democracy and saying that's why we engaged in the struggle. That is patently absurd. We were not fighting and we are not fighting to perfect American democracy. And anybody says we are, let's talk. Very seriously, let's talk. Let's have a conversation. What we're fighting for is our common humanity. We're fighting to be in the world. 
And so when we bring John Brown into a governance formation to have a conversation about John Brown, you know what he loses when he comes in that conversation? His whiteness. And now you're going to get down with us. I'll never forget, you need, you need a Blackwell saying this. She said in the Eyes and the Prize interviews and then in the times when we all had a chance to sit with her over the years, uh, many years ago, you know, she said, you know, when these white people, white volunteers came to Mississippi, they ate the same pinto beans we ate. Why? You're going to stay in my house. You're going to live next to you. Then, you know, we cook pinto beans in the kitchen and we giving them out. And then you, you line up and get your bowl. We're not treating you any different. And many of the white people, including the white members of SNCC, understood and embraced the fact that they could lose their whiteness in SNCC, which is why when the turn to black power came and the idea was conveyed to many of them that your job is to go into the white communities and, and, and fight that. This is that anti-racist thrust in some ways. It was very hurtful to them. And I absolutely understand that. It's very painful. And I would sympathize with them. I might even support say, well, no, nah, don't put them out. But at the same time, we didn't make this mess. And it's going to be some pain involved in this mess. And damn it, black people didn't carry enough of the burden. I was walking to talk about them indigenous people. They didn't carry enough of the burden. It's time for some white pain. In the words of Minister Louis Farrakhan and Martin Luther King, it's time to redistribute the pain until there is no pain for anyone. But what we're going to stop being is being beasts of burdens for your settler project. And then you got us thinking some kind of way that that sacrifice, which Derek Bell called the involuntary sacrifice, is somehow noble. This is the problem at the heart of the fear. Because if you never think you did anything, if you don't recover your past, Recovery being the first step. Why did Hollis Watkins name his memoir the Sankofa of a movement man? Go get it. Return and get it. And then you move forward with it in full momentum. You're not going back to the past to live in the past. The past recovering memory is the first step. It's, it, it's a first step in a clear understanding, a clear thinking, and a clear planning. He got a chapter in here on critical thinking. To think critically, you've got to have a place you're standing in to observe the world. Ways of knowing. You've got to have ways of knowing. And in the present, somebody said, can you, and again, in answering this question, can you imagine a world without whiteness? Guess where that world is right now? Right here. That's the answer. Where is whiteness right now? We're talking about whiteness, but we're not talking about it as a figment of the white imagination. We're in a governance formation now. Nate Norman brought up something. Professor Norman, who has spent his whole adult life teaching and learning. He's turned 82 this summer. 81, rather. 81 this summer. And, you know, we were sitting talking last night and he said, you know, he taught for many years at City College in New York, right there on the hill in Harlem. And by the way, I saw, probably, you probably saw, some of y'all probably saw the long New York Times article uh, this week. I talked about it with my Education in Black America students on Thursday. Uh, the big, the Who's the biggest landlord? in new york city right now and by the way people in new york it said it would cost 100 billion dollars over decades to fix that sewage system it ain't gonna be done please be safe because i think the the, the limit is 1.74 inches per hour of rain and mm -hmm. i guess friday morning it rained over two inches and then kept raining so is everybody uh, if you checked on all you folks but i know i know i have there. yeah i mean yeah and it it, it it did not uh stay in the borders of new york jersey jersey oh, those of us who have, those did of you us get it have, Oh hell yeah! I had uh, I had a little mini flood in my basement, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, here, mopping, wet vacuum. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's a thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, my goodness, yeah. Uh, I mean, but it's a function of the climate and all of that, and and, and you know, probably the need to move from these places, which yes. our ancestors knew, which the indigenous people knew. You don't stay in one place too long because no you know you got to move around. No um, but yes, thank you for putting that out uh, for the people who are suffering right now. Of course, for the people, no question. And of course, now you know the next thing. Of course, we know is the mold. So you got to yeah. be real careful with that. Of course, and you're absolutely right. In fact, that was the front page of today's New York Times, this morning's Times. Global warming. This is the end, and it's going to get worse. So absolutely. But yeah, they had a, uh, the biggest landlord in New York now is Columbia University. They <laughs> built a whole new campus in Harlem after waiting years of back and forth. Lee Bollinger, the president of Columbia, Tama. they every year, because they are tax exempt, they save one hundred and seventy four million dollars a year. In in taxes, now they pay some voluntary taxes and new york collects i think 31 billion dollars a year in property tax so it, it wouldn't make a dent except when you got to cut your budget 
for immigrant services, when you got to cut your budget for after school programs, when you got to cut your budget for prison programs and that little shit, that $174 million would mean you wouldn't have to cut any of the programs I mentioned, which is what the New York Times was talking about as they extol the fact that they have expanded this. They got a $14 billion endowment. They have passed NYU, who used to be the biggest. NYU pay, uh, they say like 150 some million dollars a year in property taxes. But anyway, you know. Wait, so, so Doc, is academia another tax shield? Yeah. Tax haven? Oh, no. Uh, Scott Galloway down at NYU who works at NYU. Scott Galloway, and we've talked about this many times, his book Post-COVID, which I recommend. Scott Galloway said, these universities, the big ones with these endowments, oh, he said they're hedge funds. They're hedge funds with classes for the children of the investors. And then they let a few freakishly smart individuals in to cover the stink. Oh, they're hedge funds. This it, is the whole point. So, so it's not about affirmative action or making sure everyone has a, a access to a great education. <laughs> Dr. Cards. It's, it's a money grab. I love I love it. We, we have a fun this Saturday morning. You already know the answer. I love it. I lo- and I love the, the, the perfectly tuned uh, tongue in cheek in your voice. <laughs> I mean, as Ed Lou said this summer. 31 million people in this country between the ages of 18 and 24, 19 million of them will not take another class in a classroom after high school, if they make it through high school. And of the 12 million or so who will go to college, only 68,000 of them will end up at the so-called Ivy League, which would include Columbia, the biggest landlord in New York. Meaning what? The argument over affirmative action, at least in higher education, is a class, there's a class issue that's very problematic. Where are the community colleges in this conversation? Where are the two-year and the four-year colleges? Where is where Lou Reed Daniels favorite works every day? Where is Mega Evers in this? Where is Chicago? Chicago State, you know, where is uh, the, the federal or the community colleges of Chicago? These are the questions. And we talked about that uh, about a month ago. And of course, you know, it's not just the Ivy League. Uh, USA Today had a report yesterday. They said their low estimate, their very conservative estimate, because they don't have the revenue yet from, for example, merchandise sales, is that the Deion Sanders effect in Colorado is about so far $298 million in profit. We're going to stop being a race of children at some point. And most of that is generated from the free publicity. Not just ticket sales, which are like 20 million uh, increase. Not just some of these other things they put. They said the vast majority of this is us talking about it. And I'm going to stop talking about it now. But the point is this, that as you say, the universities, the big ones, you know, the Ivy League got these huge endowments. These big state colleges got us running up down ball fields, making them millions. And then we sitting here thinking that's achievement when we get in those spaces, not that we shouldn't be in those spaces, but what it does is reinforce the idea that somehow we can't be self-determining. So that Hollis Watkins is being uh, funeralized, as we would say in our Ibanez form, in ways of knowing, at a campus and lived and worked in a city, Jackson, Mississippi, that was trashed in 60 minutes in a in, 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 in a in a in a segment on a cat that's taken his ability, brilliant ability to manipulate media to Boulder, Colorado, and made the rich richer. And the whole idea is somehow we saying, yeah, that's inspirational. Is it inspirational? You're you probably need to go back to school because you're being taken to school now. It's just not your school. So the future then. The blackness without whiteness in the present is what we're doing right now. The work now, the gathering now, the reliability of companions, what the Egyptians would call people of Kemet, Shemsu, companions, as Ayikwe Arma translates that word. And it's slow, patient, accretive work. There's no way around the slow work. And it's not going to be comfortable. Somebody says, for example, you know, this is my mentor. I say, okay, and when they finish, it's okay, out of love, I know what you mean. Let's find some other words for that because mentor has a particular genealogy. Maybe Jegna is a little bit better. Maybe calling somebody a say is a little bit better. It may seem like a small thing, and it is a very small thing, but as we begin to change the language, we also begin to connect to different cultural assumptions about the nature of what we're doing. And as we do that, the future then doesn't isn't just speculation based on wild kind of have glimpsed notions of what we might do. The future without whiteness becomes the momentum of memory and accomplishment. Built things, accomplished things. We did not have narrative before COVID, but we gathered. Our world without whiteness 
which includes people who will be marked by the social structure as white who come into space, but we are not centered around them. We're not centered around that and neither are they. They are centered around the governance formations that we're engaged in. The conversations with our ancestors we're engaged in. The answer to the question, can we imagine a world without whiteness? We don't have to. We're living in one literally right this second. And to sustain it, we have to draw from before there was a whiteness, using it in this space, adding our experiences, and then projecting forward a world where, as we talk about Thursday night, John Brown just becomes another heroic figure, but we don't elevate him above anybody else. The black women who kept his family fed after he was executed with his sons. The black people who gathered money and kept them indoors. But guess what? Those people might be on a plaque somewhere. They might, their names may be in a book somewhere. But what they're not, where they are not, is elevated to this form of superhumanity called whiteness. Whiteness must be destroyed. Without destroying whiteness, we're going to keep coming back to the question you asked, Prof, which is, you know, how do we, uh, you know, why do we find ourselves trapped in these conversations? And are we afraid? Of course, we're afraid because the world that we want to live in, the world that we can see around us, if we just tune our eyes and our ears and to be able to receive it, that world we live in. But it isn't enough to live in it in the present. That's that kind of existential blackness, that moment to moment blackness, which is better than not but ultimately leaves you kind of frustrated. So, you know, you see a bunch of brothers run out on a football field and you say, yeah, this is a victory for us, except when you have memory. Then it becomes something that's not a victory. There's a moment of satisfaction when you see it, but then you realize, well, hell, the damn players on the University of Oregon team were black too. They just got a white coach. So it's not black versus white, it's black versus black. <laughs> I mean, but anyway, but you got to understand. So anyway, you know, just thinking about that question today. Can we imagine a world without whiteness? And the lessons we can learn, even from recent memory, brought me to something else. Um, tomorrow, I'll be on campus at Howard. Tomorrow night, I think it's at seven. Y'all had to look it up. Somebody could put it in the chats. Um, If you... Read any number of books, and this is uh, Jill White's book on Hattie McDaniel, uh, our sister here, the great Hattie McDaniel, born in 1893, Wichita, Kansas, made transition in 1952. Hattie McDaniel, of course, as we know, who won the uh, Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences Best Supporting Actress Award, the Social Structure Award for her work in Gone with the Wind, Hattie McDaniel's who appeared in several hundred films. There's no way to do a complete filmography because she didn't have speaking roles in many of them. She had speaking roles about 83 of them, however. Uh, Hattie Daniels, who was one of the first, if not the first woman of African descent to record sound, who was also a singer, uh, also very serious political, um, political actor, movement builder and joiner. Uh, she gave a talk at Howard University back in, I think, 1941. There's a famous, there are famous pictures of it. You can find it. And this is after right after she won the uh, the Academy Award. And at that time, they were not giving the statues. I think like from 1936 to 1942 or three, they didn't give statues to the best supporting actresses and actors. They gave plaques. Plaques. Well, Hattie McDaniels wanted her plaque, in fact, willed her plaque, in fact, told her, told the people that she wanted her plaque to go to Howard University. And some of y'all probably heard this story many times. In fact, there's a, there's a great law review article called Finding the Oscar. It was published in the Howard University uh, Law Journal, uh, formerly edited many years after that by Angie Porter. 55, this, the citation is 55, which is the volume number, Howard Law Journal, pages 107 to 171. This was published back in 2011 by a professor at George Washington University Law School named W. Burlett Carter, B-U-R-L-E-T-T-E, -T -T -E, Carter, as in Jimmy, as in James Earl Carter, called Finding the Oscar. And he walks through the whole conversation, her will, the pro, what, what happened in probate, uh, because uh, the estate was ordered by the courts to 
sell everything to settle affairs, this kind of thing. But ultimately, the appraiser of the estate looked at the plat and said it has no value. The asset had no value. But she wanted to go to, Osc uh, to, to Howard, send it to Howard. And so it took almost 20 years, 1961. Uh, no, actually 10 years, nine years for uh, an actress, Lee Whipper, to deliver the plaque to Howard. It got to plaque to Howard and it was put on display. And then sometime in the 60s, it disappeared. What? And it disappeared. And all kind of rumors, all kind of speculation. When the students took over the administration building in 1968, which is hilarious because that's when Felicia Allen and Debbie Allen were in undergrad at Howard University. Uh, they say, well, maybe the students took it. There's a, there's a rumor that one of the student protesters threw it in the Potomac River. We don't need to deal with this all time stuff no more. What? And anyway, long story short, there was a long article in the New York Times the other day. Uh, written by our brother Jonathan Abrams, who actually has written an excellent book on hip hop called The Come Up. He's a writer for the New York Times, The Come Up, an oral history of the rise of hip hop. So he wrote an article on the ritual that is going to take place tomorrow at 7 p.m. When, and I told my law students Thursday night because they've asked me to be on a panel. I think it's going to be a little bit of a maybe like a 20 minute conversation about the meaning of what's about to happen. And I told the students, I said, I hadn't looked read great detail at the <laughs> at the parameters. And now, you know, we don't be bringing up Hattie Daniel much around Howard because the running joke is Howard lost the Oscar. So people think it was the statue. You know, I mean, I thought it was a statue for years till I realized that the plaque they gave said the statue. Did the students take it? Did a professor take it? I mean, what happened? Well, It'll be nice to have Dean Rashad there, of course. It kind of brings it full circle as well because tomorrow night the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences is going to um, bring a replacement plaque ahead of me, Daniel. And uh, it's going to be a very powerful moment to, you know, to bear witness to that. Not because I give a damn about the Academy Awards. I don't give a damn about the Academy Awards. But again, it brings us back to this question, can we imagine a world without whiteness? Because what I give a damn about is this sister right here. What I give a damn about, and this is a little book on Hattie McDaniel and Butterfly McQueen by Charlotte Horton. Here they are together. You know, Butterfly McQueen stayed in Hattie McDaniel, one of her properties. Half the book is on her, half is on Butterfly McQueen, who, of course, was in um, Gone with the Wind, the movie Gone with the Wind. You know, what I care about is out of our government's governance question, who were, who were Hattie McDaniel and Butterfly McQueen to us? And who were we to them? And when you don't have a lot of options, the famous Hattie McDaniel quote when she was challenged about the role she was playing, she said, I would rather play a maid than be one, which is not a denigration of women who cleaned up houses after all, because Hattie McDaniel understood that life. If you ever watch her own film, she has a very powerful presence, even in these roles that we would consider and know were demeaning and designed to be demeaning. I was watching some Hattie McDaniel clips the other night, late at night, just, you know, getting my mind right, thinking about Hattie McDaniel as I'm rereading and thinking about, you know, a 20 minute conversation, you know, just long enough to boom, boom, boom. But as I'm watching her, I was watching a clip with her and, and James Cagney and James Cagney eating pork chop that she just made, you know, but I'm listening, you know, oh, Hattie, I mean, not Hattie, whatever her name was, blah, 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 blah. and Hattie McDaniel was responded to him, which is very kind of dead center kind of friend. and you say you okay this is how black women had to talk to these white boys the whole time they were in their kitchens there's a certain dignity and i'm not not a not an elevated dignity a way of knowing and being in the world that is absolutely normative the, of the two people in that conversation if you got to pick and say one is the human being it ain't jimmy cagney the white boy it is hattie mcdaniel and so the only chance jimmy cagney has of being human in the world is for him to drop his whiteness in that conversation he's in a straight jacket too but guess what of the two straight jackets which the one is lethal the one that's lethal is the one on hattie mcdaniel and so when jill watts names her book hattie mcdaniel black ambition white hollywood what you're getting out of it is that hattie mcdaniel lived in a government governance formation with the organization she supported with her dollars and with her time as she spoke whether it be the naacp whether it be the hbcus 
whether it be Hattie McDaniel taking a stand and being interviewed in Ebony Magazine and talking to me. And she had a party, Beulah, her radio show. Millions of people listen. Many people, white people, most of them perhaps probably even white people. But in Ebony Magazine, they show a spread where she's bringing everybody to her house to celebrate her success. And who's sitting there as well? E. Franklin Frazier, professor at Howard University and his wife. I'm saying you, you've got Hattie McDaniel lived in us in a governance formation and she had to negotiate a social structure. So when the brother got up yesterday and asked that, well, what is the, where's the future of black people in the absence of white people? And there was all this answering that didn't ground out of governance. I found it ironic because much of the conversation over the arc of three days had been in governance, at least ostensibly in governance, but the moment of confrontation is in the words of uh, slick Rick, it was the moment I feared. <laughs> I don't want to fight these people. Because if I fight them, I'm going to lose. I, I used to say this all the time to students. I would say sometimes we'd be talking and say, well, I said, you know what? Black people who don't think we can win start making deals. We can't win. So let me make a deal. I'm going to get me and these three people and then we'll live to fight another day. That live to fight another day logic is at the center of how we can't progress. It's very important to us to understand that. And so I'll end with this and then, you know, we'll kind of phase out for today. I was on campus late last night after the conference. The brothers, uh, Brother Josh and his crew over at the Minute of Mecca, they have they have a ritual that used to be done for many years. Shout out to Dean Mark Lee, who used to do something called the burning of the fears. You write your greatest fear down and burn it. So they had a, a fire, you know, Brother Elijah and Josh, the crew there. Uh, Dean Bernard Richardson, Dean of the Chapel, uh, my former student who's now works at Howard, Calvin Hadley. We were all in there with these young brothers. And they asked me to do a libation. So I did. Um, and I evoked the name of Mark Edward Mack. We stand outside of Frederick Douglass Hall. Mark Mack, who was in charge for years of the New York African burial ground after his friend and brother Mark Blakey left Howard, went to the College of William and Mary. Mark Blakey, uh, Michael Blakey, by the way, is also on the board of the Middle Passage Ceremonies and markers project we were talking about earlier um and cobb and ann chen and i talked about mark because mark passed away in, after a tragic auto accident the day before graduation at howard um maybe about 12 13 years ago and mark worked on the new york african burial ground because that's where you know howard was where they took the remains of those 419 africans who they took out of their resting places in lower manhattan and Pace University was involved and black people laid down in front of the bulldozers and said, hell no, nah, we ain't going to do that. You're going to send these to black people. And then Howard became the, the custodian, the trustee for 10 years. And then they were returned. By the way, the 20th anniversary of the unveiling of the monument in lower Manhattan will be Wednesday. I'm actually going up there. My man, Jimmy Cleckley, uh, they, the park service, they asked me to come up and pour libation, which is an honor of my life. I did it for the 20th anniversary of the the actual dedication of the burial ground and that dedication of the monument 20th anniversary is coming up. Um, and so I'm very happy to be able to do that. And I'll be there Wednesday morning. I think it's at 11, but in the libation on yesterday, last night, I vote Mark Matt because I said, you know, Mark, one of his things was taking care of black cemeteries. There's an article in today's New York times about cemeteries three black women, including a sister here in DC at Georgetown who are trying to recover these black cemeteries because that's where our anchor is. That's self-determination too, where we place our people. Our place is self-determination. And so, you know, and pouring that libation, connecting past to the moment we were in, in a convened black space and imagining a future where this is passed on, we have to remember that we don't live in a figment of the white imagination. We live in ourselves so um can we imagine the world without whiteness if we don't the world's done the world is done for everybody so i'll stop with that i'm gonna have to sit with this um and actually you know i had started this whole like questioning people and it was odd to me because I thought folk would have an answer when I asked them what it meant to be white. And even after listening, I'm be on the air uh, nine years, October 6th. Mm. People stop calling because <laughs> oh. they, know, they know if they call as a white man, 
as a white man, I've, you know, and it's usually anger. I just happened upon this show. And as a white man, I'm, you know, and it'll be there. And I'll be like, okay, pause. What does that mean? What does it they mean? They cannot answer it. They cannot answer it. It was the moment I feared. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> right. and, and, and now you got, you know, you got the cheat note. You know, I'm going to ask you that. Yes. And you still can't answer it. Still can't answer it. So if you can't answer it, Dr. Carr, what is your responsibility? For white people? Yes. For so-called white people, because it's a construct. Oh, I don't. You know, a, you know it's, for, it's interesting. Uh, it was interesting. So much of the conversation that we were having is about that and our responsibility. You know, when Mike and Nicole were talking, a lot of it was about, you know, Nicole said, you know, we're a minority. We're 12% in this country. So we got to get some of these people over on our side. And I said, that's true. If you're talking about this country, why we keep. Wait, wait, wait. Well, first of all, <laughs> what is blackness? You know, again, these things, these, there was no Latino or Hispanic. So no. What, what were they before 1970? Well, this, you see where we go. Yeah, you see. I'm saying, like the Irish weren't white. What were they before? No. They were like, so. You see okay. where we're going. Right. So I'm saying not our responsibility. I know what our responsibility is. Keep living. Keep fighting yeah. for humanity. Keep yeah. going. I'm saying the folk that identify so strongly with whiteness that they will give up their health care, their their ability to earn money, their teeth, as you would say. Which is, <laughs> what is their responsibility if they can't even answer the question what it means to be white? I, you know what? I think uh, I think their responsibility is to give up their whiteness. But but I'm saying I don't mean that in a flip sense. What I simply mean is this. The most effective movements of African people in the contemporary world have been the ones that didn't even try to answer that question. Okay. I mean, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I ask students all the time. I said, where did all those young people you see getting hit with fire hoses and dogs, where did they go to school? The answer is black institutions, segregated schools and HBCUs, meaning what? The irony of the so-called civil rights movement in the United States of America is the people that transformed that dimension of the country came out of black institutions. And once that was transformed, now we take in the L. Why? No, you don't give up your center. We were going to the march from a place. Tougaloo was a, was a, was a, was a, as you know well, having spent time in Mississippi. When you go in Mississippi, the social structure narrates Mississippi as hell. And then when you go to Mississippi, like, I'm at home. These black people here, come on. This is what I'm talking When you been, when you walk the campus of Jackson State, when you down there in Tougaloo, you are at home. You can drape a damn buffalo in Colorado with some Gucci and some gold chain. Bruh, go with God, brother. I'm not mad at you, but that swag that they love from you came from a place. You didn't learn that in Boulder. You brought that with you from Florida. You didn't bring it from Florida State either. You brought it from your family. And it was molded. And so they, what they love is they want that, as Greg Tate would say, they want that without the burden. No, you got to give up your whiteness. Now, there are some of us who have made a very healthy living in telling them that. I, I, life is too short. Maybe when I was 28, I can, I'm 58 years old now. Every second I'm gonna breathe is not gonna be the convincing white people to change. Thank you. you know what I'm, saying? Uh, I'm not gonna do it. I ask questions sometimes because uh, I want I, I, I need us to think more deeply because I think yes. we don't we're not in a space of, of deep thought, deep reading, deep study, deep anything. Everything's very surface, very very superficial, and uh, not very nourishing. I love this space because it is so nourishing. We just had a conversation about. You know the the finite amount of energy. Uh, I mean, yes. energy is inf infinite, but individually, we just have this however much time we got on this earth, and then twenty four hours in a day. We all got the same twenty. So, what are you going to spend your time doing? I want to seed and build and grow and be in community with people that I feel good being around because they uh, love humanity and yes. I love humanity. We have common goals. That's what I want to do with my time. And I'm grateful that you have made it really simple. <laughs> it's so simple. We make it simple with each other. This is our black space. Yes. So, and so I, if I, I should I should mention a, just yes. a couple of other people very quickly. One is the great Pearl Bowser. Um, Pearl Bowser, who many folk in here know, uh, the sister, black filmmaker. Uh, she created foundations on black filmmaking. Uh, she made transition uh, about two weeks ago in Brooklyn, but her obituary appeared in Thursday's New York Times. That's Pearl Bowser, who shined a spotlight on early overlooked black filmmakers. You know what? 
Wait, you know what's wild? Okay, I'm sorry. Baby. No, no, no. That's why I'm. This is what we talk about. Okay, you know, you know, I teach, right? Um, yes. Uh, every semester, I have my students do the, do their own obituaries, which is always like, oh my god, it's it's a daunting assignment. But I use the New York Times as kind of like you know the the beacon of how it should be done, and and I show them the format in each. So I went through uh, like three obituaries yesterday to show you oh. know first name, last name, comma, claim to fame, comma, uh, you know that they died, period, their age, next graph. Uh, what they died from or who confirmed the death, right? And then they break down the claim to fame. That's the format of an obituary and it's it, it doesn't change. So I want to teach them the format. And Pearl Bowser was one of the obituaries because oh. I picked them so that they can also learn about different people. So there was an artist and I on purpose picked Pearl Bowser so that they can get a fullness. And then you hold it, hold that up again, please, because I, I, we can't make this up. No, we can't. I'm telling you, the ancestors are real. This is, it had to be. There she go with her fine fly self in yeah. 2010, born and raised in Harlem. Of course, she look. She knew she got it in your hand, and it got it right into this day. So that 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 that, that I wanted to raise her name, and also we know uh, I think the uh, senior citizen, uh, senior citizen, and senior senator from California made transition, Diane Feinstein. And of course, you know, to her family condolences and, and all that, uh, all of it. And now of course, Gavin Newsom has said that he won't appoint anybody to fill the temporary spot until the election for 2024, who is going to run. So even though in 2021, he appointed Alex Padilla when Kamala Harris went to be vice president. And then this guy ran and was elected to a full term in 2022. So, you know, I was telling I was talking to some young people from Oakland yesterday. We were at the conference and I said, you know, oh, by the way, shout out to the Nubians who traveled. Two sisters from Chicago actually flew to the conference. Why y'all here? We here. This is Nubians everywhere. In fact, it came up, Professor Hunter, several times during the conversations we were having, including on our panel, where, you know, people were saying the Nubians are showing up here, there. It fortified us. And, oh, wow. OK. But at any rate, um, so shout out to everybody who was in this growing center. But, um. Barbara Lee probably wouldn't be appointed to fill the seat, but there are some other black women because Gavin Newsom said he's going, you know, he's saying, oh, I want to put a black woman in that seat. So maybe Shirley Weber, although who's the secretary of state in California, although she has said reports that, you know, I'm not interested in a temporary seat. Holly Mitchell, who's LA County uh, on the LA County commission uh, supervisor, actually, or uh, uh, the, the times reported maybe Angela Glover back will, uh, who is a lawyer in the Bay Area, human rights worker, uh, institution builder, educator, among other things. She worked for years with the Children's Defense Fund, helping them on, on projects, including freedom schools. So we'll keep our eye on that in terms of uh, what's going on with the open Senate seat. And then uh, did you see this whole Tupac murderer thing? Yes. Um, unfortunately, it happened on a Foolishness Friday, so I didn't... Um have the serious conversation around the, the killing of Tupac and why it took 27 years for people to uh, find the person who has been talking about their role in it for the last 20 plus years. TV or, you know, art of conversation. I mean, come on. Now. Wrote a whole book. <laughs> wrote a whole book. There's a lot of, um, you know, comment commentary around, you know, uh, Sean Combs being very nervous right now. Um, it was the moment I feared. <laughs> no, I only bring it up only because uh, uh, this brother Santi Holly, have you talked to him yet? I don't know if you talked. Not, not he, uh, he's he's written a book called An American Family, the Shakur, the Shakurs and the Nation They Created. It's very interesting. I mean, you know, it's not the book that I think that many of the people, which is why, again, again, with uh, with uh, brother Hollis Watkins, write your own memoir. I'm not a fan of these people who come in and say they're working on this, they're working on that. Elders, especially, that's why we have you know in Nubia now to build this 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 capacity to tell your own stories. But anyway, An American Family is a, is a decent book to give you a context because again, when people in this social structure think of Tupac, they're thinking about his music, they're thinking about, you know, being in the streets. But this man comes out of a genealogy and he contributed to one that is ongoing, which is really why he is relevant to us in our governance formation. So I just thought about that because yeah. it was in the no, and, and I thank you for even saying that. because Is that other book um, by Hollis Watkins, uh, Paul Coates? Like no, that. actually, and I saw Paul Paul was there the whole time. No, this is, <laughs> you know what's funny? Sankofa, it's called Sankofa Southern Publishing, Black Self-Determination. Right. They they, st they, they uh, stock it at Sankofa, 
And I'm trying to see if there's a website here. Clinton, Mississippi. Of course, Clinton, Mississippi. Yeah. But, you know, even that, because I immediately knew um, that it didn't come through, quote unquote, mainstream. No, not at all. I'm, you know, in the throes of doing some things right now. And, you know, I've been having conversations with people that people create systems when they're not creative. It's a way of, of mm. policing and, and corralling and controlling uh, the narrative when you don't have the ability yourself. Right. Yes. So so you create these systems that you can control. So and then we all run to the systems for the check. You know, right. as a folks to like, you got the people, you got the story. Tell your story, reach the people. It it'll it'll work out. No you question. know, we don't, we don't have to be behind these uh, chained environments. Uh, right. We're we're infinitely creative, and we can find many different ways to get the story told, which is what I'm really excited about uh, coming forth in the next couple of years of narrative. Absolutely, because the the whole purpose of narrative was about telling our stories. Through this lens, so yeah, and I agree with you, Flo. Your Flo is saying that this whole fetishization of black women will save us is deeply dehumanizing. It absolutely is. I and, exa it. and exhausting. Exa of course, it's exhausting. And ain't no such thing as the black women will save us or the black men will save us. No, black community. This is another lesson from Mississippi. Oh, and um, somebody said, I think Regina said that you know she wants to start a practice where she begins to draft wow. the obituaries and then. You know, when people make transition and it now help me. Well, that's it, what it, the New York Times, this is why I give that assignment. The New York mm -hmm. Times is, is you know, to, you know, to me, the blueprint for how that's done. Everybody uh, who's quote unquote famous or noteworthy already have they already have their obituary written. So uh, that's why the format is there. So when they die, you just need to put that format on because the story has already been written and everyone should be writing their own obituaries so that you put in all of the things that you that you did that, you know, only you can tell, you know, like it's, it's your story. Why leave it to somebody else to decide what's, what's good and what's not. And the format then gets slapped on the top. So Diane Feinstein's uh, obituary had been written a long time ago as all of the presidents, as all of, you know, Jimmy Carter's there, everybody's there. And the obituary writers at the New York times are some of the best writers oh, no question. Because, because it is a craft. It is an absolute, you know, skill and craft that requires uh, depth of research and all of this to make that person's story whole. Uh, that's why that's one of the first assignments I give my students so that they can you know. Okay, get that's, that's important to know. I know I saw that, uh, that uh, what's it called Obit, the documentary on the New York Times obituary writers. I saw it when it came out in theaters about maybe seven, eight years ago, and it was fascinating. They are some of the most brilliant, like you say, all they do is research. <laughs> it's really something, it's, it's an art. I, I'm glad you, you teaching those students. Is it, you think it's a lost art or is it is it lost? Yes, yes, wow. yes. All, all of this, you know. Uh, yes, yes. Um, because what that would require of you is to do what we do here on Saturdays go down the rabbit hole, you can hold up a book, say a name. I'm search researching that name, that name's usually tied to somebody else you just brought up, you know, this, this brother this morning. And I'm like, I just read about him in Robert Moses's book, and yeah. now it's connected the dots, you know. <laughs> And, and that's our job as journalists, right? To disseminate, connect dots and, and give people these kind of uh, pathways to learn more that's about right. this these subjects. So yeah, all of that. Okay. Thank you, Jahir. And YouTube said the Shakur book is not bad. I know some of the elders from the Black Liberation Army that Santi Elijah interviewed and they stand behind his work. This is why we do it together. This isn't just like you say, you and me, this is us. And so these kind of comments so uh, Monday night, and obviously, I was, you know, I'll preview the course. We're going to start another edition of the Introduction to Afro course, the Africana course. Uh, but this is no, no, no. Come on back. I'm, we're done for today. So I just wanted to mention that because this is how it works. We're we're to, we're in community having these conversations, and that's the only way it's going to work. Somebody said that's a big brick when it says it was talking about the obituaries because you you helping us understand that. So yeah, start gathering yeah. it now. <laughs> well, you know, my next thing is with uh, having sitting down with uh, the one and only the great Dr. Cat Adams. Um, yes, you know her work on Jenny. Like this, there's, there's so many people that are just really great at this, and you know, yeah. our job is to collect and gather and seed, and then it's up to the rest of us to to you know water and fertilize and do all of the other things. Absolutely, so, absolutely. Langston I in the in the, I, love you I just want to mention this very quickly. Even though Langston's mentioned in the uh, in the narrative chat. At least the one I got open with a couple of thousand, and it probably got an old flow at this point. But he, had, how did continental Africans deal with the question of preparations for I mean, pre invasion? Well, you know, when you look at the libation tradition, Kamani Nahusi wrote a great book on libations. When you look at libation during funerals or during those death rituals, you know, it isn't 
it's there. So the people who know them testify. It's almost like a cross between there's no printed program. So it's kind of like what we would do at a wake now. You open the mic and then people come to do the thing. So you're not comp you're composing it out of community, which is why it's very important for us to be in community. Because when somebody makes transition without a community, it just you can't. How are you going to eulogize them? <laughs> no, but so anyway, I love you too. No, I mean, and, and as you're talking, I'm sorry. You no. are reminding us we're oral traditional. You know, yes. this, is, this is how we carry our history, That's but we right. also need to get in the practice of the written because That's that book, right. unfortunately, the word becomes flesh, but that word stays. So we have to write it down and make it plain. We got, we have to uh, write it down, if not just for our children's children's children. We got to write it down or else somebody else will tell the story, write it down, put it in a no book, question. say it's the first ever. And then we, you know, nobody be here to dispute it. So that's exactly right. All right. Love you. Love, Love you. you too. Love see you. you all. See you all soon. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, and wait, hold on. Okay. Let me uh, do this. Dr. Carr. All right. Uh, and everyone see y'all on Monday and God bless.